Hey, what's up, everybody? Uh, my name is Julian Montgomery, and I'm a, a film composer, uh, as well as other visual media. Um, and I'm based in L.A. Uh, and just so you know, I haven't worked on anything major. I'm really at the beginning of my composer journey. I did some short films in 2018. I had several short films that I have coming up in 2019. Um, so I'm just, you know, trying to get going. Um, so the purpose of this video is to show my large orchestral template. I get a lot of questions from people on, on my template and I thought, uh, you know, since I get so many questions, I, I'll do a video. Um, so, uh, I, I first got introduced to the concept of large orchestral templates. Um, I went to some, uh, event, I think it was two or three years ago. Um, and at that event, uh, Pinar Toprak, uh, I hope I got her last name right. She was at that event and she gave, she gave a little bit of a, a demo on some work she had done for a film. And if I remember correctly, the host uh, asked her some question about, you know, the size of her session. And she said that she had over a thousand tracks. And at the time, I just thought, you know, that... That just didn't compute in my head. I, I couldn't understand why you needed that many tracks. Like, what was going on? Uh, but since then, uh, as I've kind of gone along my journey and started, you know, composing and need to be as efficient as possible, I started to find out about uh, large orchestral templates, um, and and now I have one. So, uh, just so you're aware. Uh, I run this on a mid-2012 Mac Pro. Uh, I have three 2 terabyte SSD drives, 128 gig of RAM, uh, two 3.33 gigahertz six-core processors, which gives me about 24 virtual cores. So that's the kind of machine that I'm using to run uh, my, my template. You know, so when I first started lo looking into templates, I watched a lot of YouTube videos and I got I got some help from from a guy named Steve Steele. Uh, we did a, a session over the phone. Um, and he helped me kind of get going. Um, and since then, you know, my template has gone through several iterations, and it's still changing uh, even to this day. Um, so right now, I currently have uh, I think over thirteen hundred tracks. Yeah, and. I'm doing some work on my template now. I'm reducing the number of tracks I have. I'm getting rid of some libraries and some patches. Um, you know, it'll probably be closer to 1,200 when I'm done. But I mean, that's still a lot of tracks, right? I actually do have a smaller template that I use for more uh, electronic music. Um, but I use I use this template for orchestral and hybrid orchestral cues. Um, also, if, I, if I'm starting a queue and I'm really unsure kind of what I want to do with that queue, I'll, I'll use this template uh, just because it just gives me a lot of things at my fingertips. And so when I say template, I'm talking about a combination of my DAW uh, VE Pro, uh, Vienna Ensemble Pro, and another application called Composer Tools Pro, which runs on my iPad. So uh, when I started doing, uh, trying to set up my template, I was actually using Pro Tools at the time. And I ran into a, you know, a lot of problems trying to set up a large template. So I eventually switched to Cubase uh, earlier in 2018. Um, and I actually have a whole video on why I switched to Cubase from, from Pro Tools. So you can watch that video if you are really curious. Um, so, you know, as I said, my template is still a work in progress, um, but this is, you know, what I'm going to show today. So we're going to start with uh, VE Pro. Um, and so uh, VE Pro is uh, made by v Vienna Symphonic Library. Um, and I'll, I'll have links in the description to all the things that I'm talking about in this video. Uh, so, uh, there's a lot of different ways, you know, if you look at, at, uh, 
YouTube videos of people showing their, their, their templates, you know, you'll see various ways that people have things set up. Um, you know, I, this is how I have it set up. Um, it works well for me. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I used VE pro pretty much, uh, strictly to, uh, have, uh, orchestral patches preloaded. So all, all I have in here are orchestral um, sample libraries. Um, I don't do any mixing in VE Pro. I, I, I choose to do that in my DAW. Um, and I don't have, uh, you know, many other libraries other than orchestral. Um, and the only, only other thing that I might have that isn't orchestral is something that may have come bundled with one of my uh, um, orchestral libraries. For example, I have uh, Metropolis Arcs uh, 1, 2, and 3 from Orchestral Tools, and that has a bunch of, uh, um, you know, orchestral uh, types of, of instruments, but it also has some guitars, for example. Uh, and I have, the I, I ended up just going ahead and putting those in my, in my template. Um, so, um, VE Pro, uh, it's kind of the architecture of it is you basically have this this one this application, um, and it 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 can be accessed over a network. Although in my case, I only have one machine right now, so on this machine I run uh, uh, my DAW and VE Pro. And I, let me correct myself. I, I do have a laptop, but uh, that you know that runs something something else. Uh, I only have one machine that I can run my DAW and VE Pro on. And so I'm hoping, you know, in 2019 to, to be able to get a, another m machine and then I'll, I'll run VE Pro on a separate machine. But for now, it's all on one machine. And uh, uh, in, in VE Pro, you can have instances. So each one of these blue boxes up here is an instance. I have seven of them. Strings, epic strings, brass, woodwinds, orchestral percussion, epic percussion, and film composing tools, which are just kind of some miscellaneous things. Um, and so each instance then can have channels. Um, and so I'm kind of showing my brass instance. And I, I use folders uh, quite a bit. Uh, so within like my my horns folder, I have uh, the what I call my horns long uh, instance, and so within an instance you can run a a VST or plugin. So uh, in this case, I, I use a lot of contact instruments. Um, I also have some. Uh, 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 what is it? Hollywood Brass from East West. Um, and I have the Hans Zimmer strings from, from Spitfire. Both of those, they don't run in contact. But other than that, everything else are instruments that run in contact. So you'll see, you know, a lot of my template on a, on a, a lot of my channels, I should say, run an instance of contact. And then contact, you know, lets you run different uh, uh, plugins or different instruments within contact. So, um, you know, that's pretty much how every every instance is set up. You know, I'll, my strings, I'll have, let's say, you know, violas, and, 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 and I'll have a folder. That's just kind of how I have it set up. So then in my violas folder, I have a violas channel, which is, in this case, it's all... Uh, uh, libraries from, uh, let's see, what do I have in here? Cinematic Studio Strings. I think I might have some uh, Cine Strings. Uh, what is this? This is Spitfire Chamber Strings. Um, so, you know, these are, are ones that I chose to put in my, in this violas uh, channel um, and each each channel you you assign a MIDI port now I have uh, VE Pro set up uh, let me pull up the preferences here 
So per instance, I have I can have up to 32 MIDI ports and 60 audio outputs. I don't really use inputs, so I just kind of have that at a low number. And then um, each uh, uh, instance I have set up so that it will use um, uh, two threads. So VE Pro will allocate two threads to each instance. So with that configuration, uh, each channel, as I said earlier, can have can be assigned to a port. So I have 32 ports to choose from. This particular channel is assigned to port three. Um, if I go back over to brass, I have another 32 ports that I can use. And this horns long, uh, horns longs uh, channel is assigned to port one. And so I'll, the way I have it set up is every channel, uh, all of the MIDI channels uh, can can uh, can come into this. I don't know this 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 channel, and then each instrument loaded within contact then gets assigned to a specific MIDI channel. So, for example, horns A4 legato is assigned to channel one. Horns A4 core is assigned to channel two. You know, horns A4 decorative is assigned to channel three. So, this particular uh, VE Pro channel can uh, receive all uh, MIDI channels that uh, come in through port one on this instance, and then each instrument can then basically respond to a specific MIDI channel. And that's pretty much how I have everything set up. Um, then the other, the other uh, aspect of this is the, the output routing. So I've, you know, for the most part, I have, uh, I split things up between longs and shorts, and I'm kind of showing brass here because that's the most recent one that I've updated. Uh, so it looks more like how I want everything to look. Uh, some of these other ones I'll show you. They don't. I'm using more outputs uh, than I than I really want to. But uh, this one here is pretty much kind of how I'm, you know, the kind of the direction I'm going with the latest iteration of my template. So. Uh, so for example, this particular channel, uh, channel one here, everything in here is what I am kind of allocating to horns longs. So, uh, and they will all, uh, if you look at, I'll open up a few of these here, they're all using output one in this particular instance of contact. Okay, so, uh, I'll look at another one here. I'll put channel one. So, uh, so then uh, I have this particular uh, channel routed to the output one and two for this instance. So everything coming out of this particular instance of contact will get routed to channel one and two of this brass instance. Now, to show you a little bit different example of this, here I have horns longs uh, from uh, Hollywood Brass. And I also have horns shorts from Hollywood Brass. So whereas in, in this first one I showed you, these are all longs in this same uh, instance of contact. This particular scenario here, in this instance of play, I have longs and shorts. So I have uh, the longs just kind of routed to the, the first, basically one and two. And then I have some shorts down here that are routed to three and four. And so, so then I take uh, the instance, uh, 
channel the channel information over here and i say okay anything coming out of one and two from uh from from hollywood brass is going to be routed to instance one and two and anything coming out of inst out of hollywood brass three and four is also going to be routed to instance three and four from this particular brass instance now you know it looks like it's like you know one for one so one one and two is going to one and two and three and four is going to three and four but i'll, I'll show a different example here so trumpets so trumpets here is another trumpets uh is an instance of contact that's all longs this we're receiving uh midi information on port eight and all of these will get routed to uh, we'll use output one i'll show you some examples here output one output one output one right but so this is since we're only using one contact output we only have uh you know one i guess channel routing uh here information here and so everything that's routed to output one will get routed to this instance channel five and six and so here's maybe another example of trumpets where I have uh, some longs and shorts in the same instance of contact so here's some longs they're routed to output one and here's some shorts routed to output two so um, I also have so this one I actually have combined some trumpets and some flugelhorns so flugelhorns Oh, sorry, I opened up trumpet there. Actually, let me close these. Flugelhorns are getting routed. The longs are getting routed to three. And the short are getting routed to four. So this is, you know, these are routing within contact. So over here, I have, uh, I'm taking channel one from contact and that's routed to five and six channel two from contact is routed to channel seven and eight and i combine my flugelhorns and my trumpets in the same kind of output uh routing so channel three from flugelhorns also gets routed to five and six and channel four from flugelhorns is routed to seven and eight so basically all of the longs from this channel um, will get routed to output five and six from this instance of of from this server instance and all of the shorts from this particular instance of contact will get routed to seven and eight from this uh, brass uh, server instance so um, I hope that's making sense. I'm not sure if I'm doing a, a, a good job of explaining uh, how that's set up, but that's pretty much how I route outputs from from the VST, whether it's uh, contact or uh, the play engine from east west um, or whatever the VST is. I write I route the outputs from that VST to outputs from the instance and again i have configuration uh in ve pro that i can do up to 60 outputs and everything in ve pro is like uh, stereo so really i can do 30. Um, so you know if i were to expand this i have you know up to 30 of these that I can select from. And this will become clearer when I switch over to the DAW as to what what this server instance routing, what that's actually doing. 
So um, the other thing I'll point out too is um, I I have a you know depending on the particular instrument. Um, some of these are just one articulation, so like this is just legato, whereas this one here is a uh, key switchable uh, group of long articulations, or I'll I'll say all all the articulations that I include in my longs uh, output. So you know. This includes not only longs, but uh, trills, uh, swells. I I pretty much uh, uh, try to split things, but be between you know uh, longs and shorts based on because I I'll I I might mix them a little bit differently. I might mix them the same, but I might mix them a little bit differently depending on why I'm using the the the, the, the short. So. I, uh, I, I, I include with my longs um, any, any articulation that isn't a uh, well-defined short. So if you're, you know, sh shorts are like staccato, uh, spiccato, um, you know, there's like a, there's a few, a hand, a few of them that I'll include with my shorts. Now you might organize them differently, but that's how I organize uh, and, and try to group uh, these different articulations. So, you know, in this case, I'll use I'll use key switching whenever I am accessing horns A4 core. Uh, um, and you'll also notice that uh, any of the articulations that I deem shorts will be uh, unloaded. So, uh, so they'll you know just trying to reduce the the memory footprint. Um, here's another example from uh, from Cinematic Studio Brass. I have all of the uh, articulations that I include with with longs, and then there's certain ones here that are um, uh, unloaded. Uh, you know, just again to re to reduce the memory footprint. So, uh, uh, and then you I'll. I'll look. I'll switch over here to trumpets. Let me see how I have these set up. Yeah. Okay. So these are, you know, the the same way. Uh, some of them are a single articulation. Some of them are are key switchable. Um, Hollywood brass. Let me switch to that one. So this is set up so that every MIDI channel is a separate articulation. Uh, except for trills, like I, on the trills, I can uh, switch between uh, minor seconds and major seconds. Um, but other than that, um, all of these are separate articulations. So it just kind of depends on the library, um, how that library uh, works. Um, a lot of the Metropolis Arc stuff, they, they just haven't made those to be able to, to key switch. So, um, let's see, I think, where do I have Metropolis Arts? Oh, maybe over here, Epic Strings, yeah. Okay, yeah, so uh, here's an example of like the Metropolis Arts. They don't do very well with key switching. So I've, when I'm using any of the Metropolis Arc libraries, they're all uh, individual articulations. Um, so, you know, it just kind of depends on the library um, and, uh, you know, just kind of how it, it'll vary. So uh, the other thing that, that I use a lot of is uh, automation. So um, let me go back here. And so you'll see, like, for example, this is Cinematic Studio Brass Horns again. Um, all of the, the microphones are assigned to um, a CC. Uh, close is 15, uh, the main is 16, and uh, the room is 17. 
uh, pretty much the Spitfire ones. So these ones I had to set up. Uh, you can learn learn a CC, um, but they didn't come pre you know with some uh, with some CC number already d defined for it. Uh, the Spitfire ones already kind of come uh, pre-mapped, so I just kind of leave them. So you know they I can I can adjust all of these microphones uh, in my session however I want a particular you know for a particular cue how I want these you know uh, the mix of the microphones to be sometimes I'll leave the the tree mic sometimes I'll I'll adjust some things based on the the given cue so you know I try to do uh, key switching and automation as much as possible because this template the 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 intent is to use load the template once and then be able to use it across different sessions so I want as much uh, information coming from the session uh, uh, that's you know changing how a particular instrument uh, is going to to sound or a particular what particular art articulation I might want to use at a given time I want that coming from the, the the session data as opposed to me clicking some buttons um, so uh, um, the, so, you know, when I first started setting up the, the template, I actually did have each instrument in, in my, uh, in contact, um, r routed to its own output channel in contact. Um, uh, and cause the, the thought process was I might want to, you know, if you're using, let's say you're, you're, let's say you're using, uh, horns, a four, uh, legato from Spitfire Studio Brass and you're using Cinematic Studio Brass horns and you're trying to blend them together. Um, so, you know, you could come into uh, the outputs here and maybe blend them, uh, how, you know, the levels, how you, how you want them. But I didn't, I didn't, I don't, you know, I wanna uh, be able to do this from my DAW as opposed to in the uh, in VE Pro itself, because then, because again, I'm trying to have this loaded once and then let multiple sessions use the same uh, information. So, uh, what I started doing is using uh, MIDI volume information in my DAW instead of using uh, uh, output, uh, you know, gain uh, levels. In, in the contact instance running in VE Pro. Um, so that's why all of these now uh, route to, you know, the same channel, for example, channel output channel one, output channel one, output channel one. And then in my DAW, I might uh, adjust uh, the MIDI volume levels there to, to get the right mix of the, the different instruments that I might be using that are you know, really the same instrument, just from different libraries. Um, so, uh, one thing. Uh, so when I'm when I'm kind of uh, getting started, you know, I turn my my, my machine on, uh, and I want to you know get ready to start composing. Um, VE Pro is the first thing that gets loaded because uh, you know I'm going to after I load VE Pro, I'm going to load up my DAW. And it's going to try to attach to VE Pro, so VE Pro ends up being the first thing that I get started loading up uh, bef uh, when I'm when I'm getting started for for, for the day. And uh, you know I can't remember if I said this or not, but you know, right now it runs on the same machine as my DAW. Um, but uh, you know eventually I'm going to offload VE Pro to its own machine, hopefully in 2019. Um, so that's kind of you know, a snapshot of, of how I have things set up in, in VE Pro. And I'll just, you know, do a quick show of kind of how I have the different types of instruments I have in each server. So this is strings, this is epic strings. And I, I basically, for me, that's just uh, libraries like uh, Metropolis Arcs, um, Hans Zimmer strings, um, 
like I just kind of decided to put them here because I, I basically had to I had more I needed to use more MIDI ports uh, or more outputs I can't remember which, which one than I really had available in one server instance um, and I wanted to kind of limit it to sixty. Uh, when you're setting this up, you kind of have to figure out uh, what what are the right you know number of instances that you can have what are the right number of mini channels number of outputs you know all of that 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 are going to work well in your particular setup so um i kind of experimented with uh i don't know 20 outputs 40 60 um i recently just increased the midi channels to 32 and i'm still kind of trying that out to see how well that's going to work um but uh, you know, I needed to split my strings up. And then here's brass, here's uh, woodwinds, and orchestral percussion, um, and then epic percussion. So these are just other types of percussion that you that you might not find in a standard orchestra. Um, and then what I call film composing tools, which is kind of some, some extras. Um, so that's, that's VE Pro. Okay, so now I'm showing you uh, Cubase. So um, uh, one of the things that I'll, I'll start by pointing out the fact that for every MIDI channel that I'm using in VE Pro, I have a corresponding uh, MIDI track in Cubase. And uh, so, you know, I showed some, some of the violins. Um, violin one CSS corresponds to this instance of violin one you know css first violin is running here so uh you know i guess i'll just show another example um let's see this violin's one legato uh from uh, spitfire studio strings is actually this violins one legato here so every midi channel that i am using in ve pro there is a corresponding midi track in cubase so there's tons of midi tracks and you know midi tracks not instrument tracks midi tracks so um in uh in ve pro sorry ve pro uh to to use it from your daw there's a plugin that that you install uh, and i use it as a i set up these instrument tracks in cubase um and so you need to use uh for every uh server instance that you want to use in ve pro you have to have a uh a plugin in your DAW connected to that instance. So since this is a template and I'm trying to set it up to be to use all of my server instances, I have seven uh, instances of the plugin running in this template. So uh, so here's a one of the plugins and it's since it's all running on the same machine, it's connected to localhost. This could be, you know, any it, it, it can go across your your network so you can set this up kind of with a you know my intent long term is to set it up with kind of a closed uh local network and so uh you know this would connect to some other server but for now it's local host and it's connected to the strings server instance so this is connected to this server here the server instance so um, I also have it set up to preserve. So um, that means uh, um, 
you know, this, uh, whenever I start up this particular uh, template, um, this plugin is going to connect to the strings server instance and stay connected. This here, uh, you know, when I, it, it's basically whether or not the, the plugin will be coupled or decoupled. This took me a long time to figure out what that, what impact that has. Um, when I first started setting up to setting up this template, I left it coupled. And basically what happens is when it's coupled, um, it will actually save in your session all of the settings in uh, VE Pro, which is actually, I mean, that was the way that I wanted to, to, to set it up um, because then I could go here and I could make changes. You know, I could uh, go to this instance and I could change the, the, uh, the settings. I wouldn't have to do it through automation. Um, and then, uh, you know, and I could, I could, uh, I could make any changes I wanted to in any, across all of these different channels. And then when I, anytime I saved my session, all of that information would be saved with my session. And it sounded good at first, but when you have large templates, and this is, you know, what I started reading about uh, was that, you know, I mean, that's a lot of data that it saves every time you save your session. I save my session, I just, I'm just programmed to, to hit Alt, Alt S, you know, all day long, just boom, boom, Alt S, Alt S, Alt S, I'm um, sorry, Command S. And so I'm saving all the time just to make sure that I don't lose anything. And those saves were taking just way too long. So I learned that uh, you should run this decoupled if you're doing large templates. Um, and, then, and then try to automate as much as you can with your uh, instruments in your, in your template. So that's, you know, that, that, so I went through a big shift and and how I uh, ended up using my 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 template. So uh, so basically, again, this is going to basically set whether or not uh, the data from VE Pro will be stored in your DAW session or not. So this basically puts this particular plugin in decoupled mode. And this will make it so that all instances are decoupled. So that's kind of how I have it set up, that all instances are decoupled. So when I do a save, it's really quick, but it's not saving any changes I make in VE Pro itself. Um, so, um, and then, I, you know, that you can read the documentation about buffers and uh, any other thing here. Uh, so I have... Uh, Again, I have seven of these, and they're connected to each of the server instances that I have in VE Pro. So, um, uh, so back to these MIDI uh, tracks. Um, and I mentioned each track is, uh, there's one MIDI track for every MIDI channel I'm using in VE Pro. So, you'll see here. Uh, I have to select on that on a MIDI track which channel and port I'm using. So in this case, I'm using the strings uh, server instance, and I'm using port one. Um, you know, here I'm using the strings server instance and MIDI port sixteen. You know, I'll get down to let's see. Um, piccolos here. And here I'm using the Woodwinds instance. So this this instance of the VE Pro plugin, which is basically corresponds to my Woodwinds server instance, and MIDI port 11. So then the other thing on each MIDI track is the MIDI channel. So 
in this case I'm MIDI channel 1. So this is the same, this one here, Piccolo Legato, the same Woodwinds uh, MIDI port 11, but this is using MIDI, MIDI channel 2. So, you know, all of these are kind of set up that way. So then, because this is, this is Violins 1 uh, Cinematic Studio strings, uh, using the strings server MIDI port 1, MIDI channel 1. So then when I go to play this... That's playing uh, Violins 1 from Cinematic Studio strings. I can switch to this one here, which is the same strings, uh, you know, uh, server instance, but now port 16, MIDI channel 1. So now that's going to be Violins 1 Legato uh, uh, 16 with 16 uh, violins from Spitfire Studio Series. So, uh, every MIDI track is assigned to a specific MIDI uh, channel um, that I have in VE Pro. And I can, uh, you know, I'll go to maybe look at some of these other ones. I'll do, uh, uh, let's go horns here. Let's do, uh, I'll do a, let's do this one. So this is connected to the brass uh, server instance, MIDI port, what is that, two, three, three? MIDI channel one. It was kind of popping on me there, but yeah, that's MIDI, that, that's, that's kind of how, uh, um, that's kind of how it's set up here in my template. Now, I mentioned uh, that uh, in VE Pro, you know, I'm, I'm setting up routing uh, through these VE Pro instance uh, audio outputs. Um, so, where that um, comes into play is, so in, in the in in these plugins, I've activated outputs. So, uh, so back here on VE Pro, I'm on strings here. So, output one and two is violins one. A, just a completely different one here. Cellos. Output seven and eight is cellos. Seven and eight. Right? And so um, I have to do a little bit of renaming here so you know, like these are longs and then these are, are shorts. But uh, so. So when I play, I'll go back here and play this uh, Violin 1 CSS. You should see. I could play, uh, I'll do a cello. Right. So, so every instrument, uh, type of instrument, uh, violins one, violins two, uh, brass, you know, horns long, and again, this is the most recent one that I've done, so the, the, the naming is a little bit better. Um, they all come in on, on their respective uh, output. 
And so, um, so then, let me switch over to the mix console here. So here are the outputs. So, for example, here's violins one. And so that's the first level of grouping that I have is all the violins ones come in on this channel. I use, again, I use uh, if I need to do some blending, then I use my MIDI volume here to adjust the levels of the different violin ones uh, that are being routed to that one violins one group. Uh, but here is where they're, they're all being routed to this one channel. And you'll see at this point, there's panning for violins one, and there's a, there's a particular insert that I, that I like to use. Um, and you'll see all of these, well, not all of them, but a lot of them have a particular insert. And they all have some kind of panning depending on the type of instrument and where they're typically placed in an orchestra. You'll notice too that all of these inserts are disabled. So that's kind of how it's how my template is set up. Uh, these these inserts are there, and they're actually set to something. So like this insert is set to strings warmth with my particular settings that I want for that particular plugin. Uh, so once I'm ready to start mixing, then I can enable. But when I'm just composing, everything is is disabled. All the inserts and the sends are are uh, are disabled to try to minimize uh, CPU. From here, now that we have them grouped into specific types of instruments, then there's another level of grouping that happens. So violins one then gets routed to another group called high mid strings. Violins two also gets routed to high mid strings. So, so I want to now group all of what I would call my high to mid strings into one group. Violas also are routed to high mid strings. And then cellos and basses are routed to low strings. And yeah, this is basses, low strings. So then I have a set of groups here, which is where, um, where I end up really doing, uh, com you know, any kind of compression or EQ. I kind of have those put on, put here on all of these group tracks. Sometimes I don't use them. They're just there uh, in case I need to. And they're, they're they are there, um, with, uh, a specific setting that I have set up in one of my favorite compressors, uh, Fab Filters Pro C. Um, and so all I have to do is kind of, you know, enable this track and then this compression is set up and then I have to, you know, make whatever adjustments I want to make based on a specific cue. But I have a starting point. Um, and so all of these are set up that way, right? And uh, so all of these instrument groups then kind of get get grouped again in a more higher level aggregate group. Um, you know, the same thing for uh, uh, brass. So my horns, they're getting routed to high mid brass, I, and that, so I also have a shorts version of of a group. So these are horn longs, 
horn shorts are getting routed to high mid brass shorts. So what that allows me to do is to basically, uh, if I want to, I can, I can, you know, maybe uh, I have, for example, I have on the high mid brass, I have this send to the brass reverb, but then for the the high mid brass shorts, I have that routed to a uh, a reverb that's more f a, a shorter reverb, so brass shorts verb. So, um, you know, if I have a particular with, where, where I'll use this is, you know, let's say I'm going, I'm using a, a trombone, and that trombone is just doing staccato stuff uh, in a in a in a particular cue, then uh, then I'll route that to the low brass shorts, and and I'll use a short reverb. Um, but if I have a brass that's playing sustains, um, and every now and then you know playing a staccato note, but it's 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 not just shorts. I'll have I'll just I'll change. Uh, it'll come in on the. Uh, let me find it here. It'll come in on trombone shorts, but I'll go and I'll change the routing to go to low brass. So both the trombone longs and the shorts will get routed to the same low brass group. And then, and then in my low brass, then, uh, you know, I'll have it really playing longs and shorts, but it, it's kind of, it's one performance and then I'll do whatever I, you know, apply whatever inserts and sends or whatever I want to do. I was getting ready to mention earlier that there are some, uh, that don't get routed to any aggregate, uh, group. So xylophones, glockenspiels, marimbas. I feel like those are, they're all very different. Uh, I didn't want to group them together. So they come in on their respective instrument channel and then they just, you know, I'll just deal with them right at that, right at this channel. They don't get routed to any higher aggregate grouping. Um, and then there are some that uh, I'm really not sure how I'm going to pan it. There's no like predefined panning. So I just kind of leave it, you know, full left and right. And then, then once I get to mixing that particular cue, I'll decide, you know, kind of what the panning is. And, I, and really that's for any of these. It's just some of these, there's kind of more of a predefined place where it goes in the stereo spectrum based on an orchestra, but on a given cue, I might move stuff around, you know? Um, so nothing is set in stone. It's just kind of gives me a, a better starting point, uh, uh, you know, better point to start from. Let me switch back to, actually, let me, let me stay here. So, so one of the things that I will do, so, you know, I have all of these MIDI tracks, right? And there's tons of them. Uh, and, uh, and that's more, you know, I, I, I guess I go through phases. There's the composing phase, then there's the mixing phase, then there's the mastering phase. So once I go from composing to mixing, uh, then I, I hide everything that I'm not using. So, uh, you know, Cubase has a nice little feature where you can, uh, you only show tracks that have data. Um, so I can, I can do that in, in Cubase. I'm going to show an example here in a minute. Um, and then I go over to my, my mix console and I get, get rid of here, everything I'm not using. So if I have a, uh, in, in my template, I have my machina and I already have it all set up with the routing and everything. But if I'm not using that at all, boom, it's gone. Right. And so, uh, I get rid of everything that I'm not using on that queue. So while this might look like a lot, when it comes down to mixing, I'm only going to have in here anything that I'm using. Everything else gets hidden 
and everything on those tracks is disabled. So, you know, then when I mix, you know, and, and it's a, it's, uh, oh, this isn't even supposed to be, these aren't supposed to be in here. Uh, these here. Yeah, okay, yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, I just have uh, what I'm what I'm working on, and uh, and it's a lot less than what you see here. I mean, this is a template, right? So this is like, you know, the, all the different possibilities. But on a a given cue, I might only I might only use a handful of these things, um, or I might use a lot. It just kind of depends on 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 the given cue. Um. So. Uh, one other thing that I wanted to point out is, so I use, you know, I use folders and I use colors just to kind of help things jump out at me on the screen uh, and help me find things. So, you know, all of my violins ones are in the violins one folder, right? And then, you know, all of my horns are in the horns folder. folder. Um, and then, and you'll see too, there's a naming convention. So, Pretty much, it's gonna you know start with the the instrument. If there is uh, um, how many instruments are are included, so horns A four or horns A twelve, um, the, the articulation or art, or type of articulations dash the an acronym that I have come up with for for this for the 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 library that it comes from. So. I know I can look at this one and say I know this is horns, A4 legato. So there's no other articulations other than legato, and it's from Spitfire Studio Brass, right? Whereas this one is horns A4 long. So this is going to be multiple articulations, uh, but they're all going to be what I what I have grouped into my longs from Cinematic Studio Brass, right? And so uh, I I try to abide by that type of naming convention so that, you know, if I want to come here and I want to look for, I don't know, bass trumpets, I can, I can just pull this up and say, uh, I want to, I want some shorts, so I'm going to go there. And now, there I am, right? So I don't have to, I don't have to scroll all day trying to find what I'm looking for I kind of just use the power of uh, um, of Cubase's find to find different tracks right um, so um, you know that that helps me since I have so many MIDI tracks that helps me find what I'm looking for. I mean, obviously, if I have to scroll around, sometimes I'm really not sure what I'm looking for. It's like I want something that's that booms or something, you know. And I'm not sure which. I know I know it's going to be some kind of percussion, but I'm not sure which one it is. So then I might I might have to scroll around and just and kind of play around with some different uh, percussions till I find what I'm looking for. Um, and the other thing, you know, I showed I showed that I that I have Machina uh, installed here, but I also have um, instrument tracks. I have uh, a few, so I use Complete Control. I uh, have the was it the S eighty eight MK two. So I have some tracks that are that are, that have Complete Control installed on them, and then I have just some other instrument tracks. Um, so if I need to you know, install, I want to use some plugin that's not in my, uh, geez, my mouse is going crazy. Uh, that's not in my template, then Omnisphere. So I don't do any sense in my template. I'll add that into this particular session. Um, you know, so that's, that's kind of how I, how I, how I work here. Um, uh, I kind of wanted to show 
an example of of a cue that I recently did, so you can kind of see what it looks like, you know, in in my template. So I'm going to switch to uh, uh, a cue. I'm actually kind of still working on it. This is uh, for for a film that I'm kind of working on right now. So let me switch over to that uh, that session. Okay, so here we have a cue uh, that I'm. I'm still working on it. It's almost done. Um, so this is using the same template, but you'll see uh, that I only have a handful of tracks showing here in the edit window. And if you look over here now at the um, the mix window, I only have... Um, you know, uh, a handful of full of tracks. I have this extra track here that I'm, you know, because I'm doing this this tutorial, if you will. You know, where when I was showing the the whole template, we have you know a lot of tracks. But once once I'm once I've transitioned from composing to uh, mixing, uh, then I can, you know, I get rid of everything I'm not using. Even while I'm composing, so in this edit window, you know, sometimes I just want to see what I'm working on, uh, see just the tracks that I'm, that I've, you know, uh, that I have some MIDI data on, um, and sometimes I want to show them all. So, um, you know, if I want to, well, want to show them all, and I, I can do that, and if I want to. Uh, just show the tracks that I have data. I do that as well. So, um, you know, I just kind of wanted to show uh, a session here um, of what it looks like once I've kind of transitioned more to mixing. So, you know, you see in this case, I'm using some what I would class, what I have classified as epic strings. Uh, from uh, Met Metropolis Arcs 1, um, using some strings from Metropolis Arcs 2, and then I'm using a bunch of session instruments. So these are things that aren't in my template, so I just added them into this particular session. Um, you know, so <laughs> I didn't know I didn't know exactly what I was going to do with this cue, so I started with my big template. But as it turned out, I only really used a handful of things. Um, so, you know, you know I'll, I'll play a little bit of this. Uh, where do I want to start from? I'll start from. So I'm still working on this, but, um, you know, just trying to get the mix right. But that's basically what, what a, uh, what a session looks like, you know, after I've kind of gotten done composing. So, uh, this is all saved in Cubase. This, my, my template is saved as, as a template. So whenever I do some, some maintenance on my template, I'll open up, uh, an actual session that I call my template builder, and that's what we were looking at before. Um, and then I'll once I once I'm done, I'll save it as a as a as a template. I just keep overriding my my template. So um, when I when I now want to go and create an actual cue from that template, I will create you know a session from my orchestral template. As I mentioned before, I have another smaller template. Um, and then, uh, you know, that will allow me to get the, get the session going with all of the connection over to VE Pro and I can, you know, start composing. Um, 
one other thing I wanted to point out real quick is, uh, so when you're doing uh, film composing, you also have video involved. Um, I, I have elected to not use the video engine in Cubase, and I run, I run all the video on a laptop that has a, you know, I have another monitor, external monitor set up, uh, and it synchronizes with, with Cubase. Um, I'll show all of that maybe in a, in another video, but I wanted to point that out. So on this computer that's running Cubase and VE Pro, um, it's not running any kind of video engine. So uh, the next thing I'm going to show is Composer Tools Pro and how that, uh, you know, is a part of my whole overall template. Okay, here we go. I'm back in my uh, template building session here. And uh, so now I want to show you uh, Composer Tools Pro. So Composer Tools Pro runs on my iPad. Uh, this is a uh, an application uh, created by MIDI Kinetics. And, uh, you know, when I first started setting up this template, uh, I saw several composers had uh, something running on a on a tablet and I could not figure out what what that was um, and so I think I finally saw a video by Scott Glasgow and and he mentioned lemur so you know that got me to doing some research on lemur and and I finally figured out you know how people were um, setting up uh, uh, applications on their iPad to interact with their DAW. Um, so, you know, I was like, man, do I, do I really have the energy to invest the time in building a, an application, you know, really customized to what I want? Do I even know what I want? I'm, I'm new to this. I, you know, I'm not sure if I could even knew what I wanted. Um, you know, if I wanted to, to pay someone, I'm not even sure if, what to tell them because I'm, I'm trying to figure this out. So uh, I finally found uh, an, applica an application called Composer Tools Pro that I thought was a great uh, initial application to use, seeing as, you know, I was new to uh, templates and... Uh, you know, it's, it's not perfect, but it, it, it works really well. And, uh, uh, you know, it kind of it got me going without me having to do a whole lot of uh, creating an application on my own. So uh, basically, uh, Composer Tools Pro is just a it's, it's built on on top of Lemur um, and it runs on your your iPad. And you basically uh, um, are, you know, I, I use it to um, to switch articulations as well as to, uh, you know, adjust microphones or do other kinds of settings um, depending on which patch I happen to be working with. Um, I'm actually still setting up Composer Tools Pro. I don't have all of the all the faders set up just yet. Um, and I do kind of use a combination when it comes to uh, faders and adjusting microphones. Since I'm using complete control, um, I can use the knobs on my on my DAW, sorry, on my uh, MIDI controller uh, to do, uh, to adjust mics. So a lot of times I just do that and I, and I won't, I won't uh, set up a fader in Composer Tools Pro. But I'll show you what I'm talking about. Uh, I do have some that are that are set up with with faders. So I'm actually gonna I'm gonna use brass uh, to kind of show how I do this since uh, since I've just kind of set this up recently. Okay, so I just clicked on. Horns A4 Long CSB, and you'll see the screen on my iPad changed as well. Um, I'll do it again just so you can kind of see it. So I'm going to 
switch up here to Horns A4 Long's Core SSB, and you'll see the screen changed on my iPad. I'm going to click back here to Horns Long A4 Long CSB, and it changed again. And so basically I have for many of the MIDI tracks where where I'm where I'm doing key switching or where I want, you know, some other kind of uh, whether it's it's faders. So here are some faders and this one. Here's even some some buttons to toggle. If I want anything like that for a given MIDI track, then I have uh, what is referred to as a preset set up in Composer Tools Pro. And then I have configured Cubase uh, to be able to talk to, to my iPad and, and vice versa so that it pulls up the right preset whenever I switch to a particular track. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll go into that here. So um, using my iPad, so I just press the sustain uh, key switch. <laughs> and I have legato on so you'll see here if I switch over here to horns you'll see it's on sustains and legato is is on so I'm going to press legato off so now I just turn legato off so now I should be able to press multiple notes. Right? So um, I could switch to, uh, we'll say, trills. And there we go. Right? So um, now the other thing is, let me go back to sustains. I have set up uh, attack and release, so I can I can go to my uh, Composer Tools Pro, my preset that I have set up for Cinematic Studio Brass Longs, and I can change the attack. Now this isn't being recorded in my DAW, so this is like if I'm messing around with a patch and I kind of want to figure out what are the right settings that I want to use for something I'm going to play. I'll use Composer Tools Pro a lot of times to test out the different articulations, play with them, uh, and, uh, and then once I have that figured out, then, you know, if I go into uh, a part, I'm just going to draw this in here. And I have these expression mats. And then I'll say, okay, from here I want sustains. And here I want a trill. And then I'll go back to a sustain. Now it's written in, now it, you know, it's controller data written into my DAW. I could also do this with, uh, with Composer Tools Pro. I could, I could record. Okay, so yeah, I could record, you know, at runtime. It's a little hard to do that to, uh, you know, maybe I do two passes where I, I record the, uh, the articulation switching and then do another pass where I actually play. Because um, when I play, I'm usually using the mod wheel to control dynamics. Uh, so, you know, I haven't yet grown a third arm, so I can't do three things at once, you know what I mean? So, you know... Uh, a lot of times I'm just, I'll just, before I record, I'll kind of figure out what articulations I want to use and I'll use uh, Composer Tools Pro to help me figure that out. And then I'll kind of draw in the articulations here in, in, the, in expression maps. So the way that this is set up. So first of all, um, I started using Composer Tools Pro when I was using Pro Tools and trying to get my templates set up, but it wasn't very well articulated so i'm sorry 
what I say articulated, it wasn't very well integrated. Uh, so, you know, when I what I showed here was when I click on a on a given uh, MIDI track, it automatically changes. But when I was in Pro Tools, it wouldn't automatically change. So when I if I switch back over to Horns A4 Longs, I would have had to go into Composer Tools Pro, find the particular find the particular preset, and then select it. Um, which is, you know, that's not that that's not working too well when you have, you know, this many presets. Uh, you can't go in there and, and search for one, right? So automatic switching is is really a huge deal when you're when you're talking about a you know a, a lot of different uh presets that you and they're custom presets i mean these are ones i created these so uh you know i can uh go into my composer tools pro app find a an empty slot and i can start editing this and you know, give it a name, and I can do all kinds of stuff, right? Um, let's see what I usually do. I use pads. Um, you know, I can do, I can do whatever I want to do, whatever the, the application lets me do, and I can set up these uh, key switches, faders, toggles. I set those up, um, and then each each one of these, so. Let me let me go back here. Um, I'll go to here. So this is set up to uh, uh, be able to be recalled on uh, channel one uh, ninety seven is the uh, uh, the the number that it will respond to. So basically, then this. In Cubase, you set up these MIDI sends, and you use the transformer. Uh, and uh, on the transformer, you say, you know, here's here's the value I want you to send, 97. Uh, and so, uh, and uh, I want you to actually send 127 on CC 97, uh, right? And so. Uh, and this is over MIDI channel uh, one. So when Composer Tools Pro receives that, it sends some information back to Cubase, um, and that they're able to talk. Uh, and this automatic uh, changing preset, oops, let me get out of edit mode, is able to work. Now, one of the key things is. I had to come into studio setup and set up a generic remote. Um, and so uh, by setting this up, then the auto recall was able to work. Um, and then I have some, uh, some utilities that I have set up. I'm still still coming up with, with more. I've just got four right now. So uh, I have the ability to say show only tracks with data and show all show all tracks or insert a marker uh, by pressing a button here. So these these are you know things uh, instead of hitting say a keyboard shortcut um, or using my mouse I just tap on on Composer Tools Pro and it will it will execute this feature. So um, since I only have one track with data, if I say if I click show only tracks with data, that'll be the track that it shows. And then if I go back to uh, show all tracks, now they're all back. You can set up Composer Tools Pro to not only do key switching and you know do specific things for a specific MIDI track, you can also set it up to just interact with your DAW in general. Uh, and so I showed also that um, in in here I had these key switches, I'm sorry, uh, expression maps. Um, so the way that, that those get created is I 
download uh, and save all this all these presets onto my computer using the lemur application and then MIDI kinetics provides a a very easy tool um, to read in this information and convert it into expression maps so I basically tell this this tool um, hey read in this this all these presets and now if I say export expression maps it exports expression maps for all of whichever ones I have selected and so I have on my uh, on my hard drive here all the all the expression maps from all of the presets that I use in Composer Tools Pro. So, so here, um, you'll see expression maps. And I have a ton of them. Right? And so that way I can use I can use if all of these, you know, before I was using uh, Composer Tools Pro, I was uh, I was doing, uh, you know, articulation switching, but I wasn't using key switches because I'm not a big fan of key switches. Um, you know, just in case, you know, if you move your notes around, it's so easy to, to mess up your, your key switches. Uh, so I was I was going into uh, all of these and um, where possible like I think with Spitfire is a lot easier uh, I was using UACC with Spitfire um, there's a way to do it here where you I think you can change these to uh, CC numbers I can't remember exactly how to do it now uh, but I was you know as much as possible I was going into the instruments here the patches and changing them to use uh, CC's instead of key switches but then once I started using composer tools pro and I figured out that I could uh, well first of all once I started using Cubase and in conjunction with composer tools pro and I started understanding expression maps then that changed my whole world and so now I use I just I go ahead and use the key switch because that's usually how they're how they kind of come predefined is uh, when you have when you're doing articulation switching they usually just come with you know keys that you switch that, that cause the articulations to switch um, and and I just convert them into expression maps from it from composer tools pro then it works great so that just kind of changed my whole world uh, for the better um, Let's see. So uh, that's basically Composer Tools Pro, um, and so the, you know the combination of of uh, Cubase, um, VE Pro, and Composer Tools Pro. I have a whole you know large orchestral template set up, um, and it works works pretty well. Uh, I will say that there are you know, there are pros and cons. So, so some of the pros are, you know, all my sounds in my orchestral libraries are loaded up. Um, I can quickly switch from one patch to another. Um, I are I can uh, quickly uh, uh, switch articulations um, and in a given instrument. Um, I can use automation to control many aspects of the patches and. Uh, and when I transition from composing to mixing, it's a quick transition. Um, but then there are some cons. So uh, because I have, you know, seven server instances with a bunch of uh, channels on each instance, it takes about 10 minutes or more to load up my VE Pro server. So 
you know, I try to only do it once, a, once you know, do it in the morning and then leave it up uh, for the rest of the day. Uh, there's also, I use a lot of the Hans Zimmer percussion from uh, Spitfire. Um, so, you know, it's a lot of, just a lot of different kinds of percussion. Um, and uh, um, once, once I integrated that into my template, uh, I found that once I connected Cubase to VE Pro, my, my CPU spiked super high, you know, almost to, I don't know, maybe like 85 to 90% CPU utilization. And so uh, I talked with uh, support at Spitfire and confirmed there's a defect in this library uh, that causes this to happen. And so until they come up with a fix with which it's been long enough now that I don't think they're going to. Um, so if I'm going to continue using these in my, in my template, what I have to do when I, once I get, uh, a session connected to VE pro, I have to go in to my Epic percussion here and I have to disable. And then I, I do, I basically do this one at a time. I'll start with this top one. I'll disable it. And then I'll enable it and I'll look at the CPU, CPU utilization using activity monitor. And I'll probably have to go down the list here four or five or six of these. And then eventually it gets down, uh, to a manageable, uh, amount. And then I can start actually composing. And that happens every time I open up a session. So I can't just open a session and then start going. I have to go through this disabling and enabling channels before I can get really get started. Um, another thing that's kind of a con to having a big, a big large uh, template is without doing anything, just opening the session, the audio performance, you know, is impacted. So there's already some load on the CPU, and I don't even have anything. I'm not recording anything. I don't have any effects going. I don't have anything going. So, um, you know, that's one thing to, to note that, you know, you're already, you're causing some CPU utilization by having this many uh, channels that it's got to connect to. Um, you know, introducing a new library in, into my, my world is time consuming. I mentioned that uh, I just redid my brass, uh, server instance. Uh, that took me about a week, uh, because what I was doing was I had, uh, I had just purchased Spitfire studio brass. Um, what else? Spitfire studio brass. I had never, I had, I had Hollywood brass from East to West, but I never, uh, added it into my template. So I wanted to do that. Um, I, and then I wanted to remove Spitfire Symphonic Brass from my template. I still have access to it. I can add anything from there as session instruments. Uh, but as far as in my template, I didn't want, I didn't, didn't want them in my template. And I also wanted to remove uh, Bernard Herman Composer Toolkit uh, from, my, from my template. Um, so I was basically doing some maintenance, uh, and, uh, and that took me about a week to do, but once it's done, it's done. And now I can access all of these different brass libraries that I have, uh, that I want to be a part of my template. You know, I can access them really easily. Um, and then I guess the last thing is with all of these channels, um, you need a higher buffer size, uh, especially when, when mixing. So I basically have to use, um, the highest buffer that 
that I can, that's available to me in, in Cubase uh, to, to keep from things popping. Uh, uh, when I'm composing, I don't have to use a buffer that, that, that high. Um, so uh, there you have it. That's, that's my large orchestral template. You know, it's still developing. I'm still getting better. Um, you know, I, I invite you to uh, share with me some, uh, some ways that I can improve my, my template. Um, and I, you know, I hope that this has been informative to those who are, you know, wanting to kind of dive into this world of large orchestral templates. Um, if you got any questions, uh, you know, feel free to post them in the comments. Uh, you can visit my website. You can, my contact information is there. You can hit me up uh, that way. Um, and, you know, I just hope, hope you find it helpful.